Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rob Atkinson. I'm president of ITIF. I want to welcome you to this uh, uh, interesting and important event to look more in depth at uh, the German uh, technology innovation system, particularly as it relates to manufacturing and high tech. Uh, so we're really uh, pleased to have a great, great panel today. Um, as you can see, we're joined live uh, from our colleagues in Germany uh, and also some colleagues from Germany and the US here on the panel today. So a little different than our normal sessions, we're gonna go till two o'clock today. We'll adjourn precisely at 2, and we should have plenty of time for questions and comments from you all. Uh, before I introduce a couple of people, I want to just make some framing remarks. So wh why, why are we doing this session? Uh, the short answer is because Germany has figured out something in the last decade at how to succeed in the new global economy that we haven't, uh, we being the United States. Uh, and you can see that in, I think, a couple of core metrics. One is a um, BLS study that just came out looking at manufacturing job growth, and this is controlling for the growth of adult age population. And what you can see is that Germany leads the uh, 10 OECD nations there. Uh, it's lost uh, from 97 to 2010, uh, just about 8% of its manufacturing jobs. Now that's sort of normal in a sense because manufacturing productivity normally grows faster than the rest of economy productivity. But you can see the US uh, losing uh, about 43% of its manufacturing jobs, controlling again for adult population growth, is the worst of these 10 countries. So I think there's something that can be learned about what the German government and the German economy has done uh, to enable this. Uh, another factor I think that's important is uh, if you look at the German exports of research intensive products, they are seven times greater than American high-tech exports as a share of GDP. Now again, you normally wouldn't think of that. You think, oh, the U.S., you know, we're the high-tech leader. We might not be able to make, uh, you know, make, make cars or things like that, although they're somewhat high-tech, but we can do high-tech. No, the German uh, exports is that are seven times, seven times higher. So why are the Germans able to do this? Uh, clearly, it must be that they don't have any regulations over there, right? Um, <laughs> No? Okay, I guess that's not it. Uh, it must be that they're incredibly low wages. They, they really don't pay the German workers very well, only 40% more than American manufacturing workers. So, so that can't be the reason either. So it's not lack of regulation. It's not low wages. What is it? Uh, I think, and this is not for a place we're going to go into a lot of detail, I think at the core, though, it's about German manufacturing enterprises focusing on continuing to move up the value chain, continuing to raise productivity and innovation. And government policy in Germany has played a key important role in that. And we're going to hear about that today, in part uh, through the German technology strategy, which you'll hear about a little bit. And then also a very important institutional uh, system or innovation that the Germans have called the Fraunhofer Institutes. Uh, we did a report that's on the back table there looking looking at uh, benchmarking SME sub manufacturing support around the world. We estimate that the German government supports the Fraunhofer system, uh, again, as a share of GDP, about 20 times more than we support our manufacturing technology policy programs in America. So they're willing to make major investments in becoming and maintaining uh, their manufacturing competitiveness. Uh, so before we kick off, I want to introduce um, uh, Peter Fisher to also give a welcome because we're really, uh, really pleased and honored to co-host this uh, with the German government today. Uh, uh, Mr. Fisher has been the minister for the head of economic affairs here in the German embassy in Washington uh, now just about four months, so welcome. Uh, he's a career diplomat with uh, prior stations in uh, Tel Aviv, uh, London, Shanghai, Singapore, and also uh, Berlin and Bonn. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Fisher, do you want to Give us some remarks. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Atkinson, uh, Dr. Halpern, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to uh, also be able to say a welcome to this uh, event studying the German uh, innovation model. Uh, it's an event uh, co-organized and co-hosted by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation the German Center for Research and Innovation, and uh, my outfit, uh, the German Embassy, or the outfit that I'm from. Um, 
Uh, normally, I, I would have to do some kind of plug and say German is very innovative. Um, but uh, if I see how many people came out to find out uh, maybe why Germany is innovative, obviously assume it must be innovative. So I can uh, spare myself that that plug, and it it, it does. Um, uh, reflect the experience that I've had since I arrived here in July. A lot of things that Germany does well seem to be very attractive to the USA uh, at this time. Um, one is that we got out of the recession relatively quickly, relatively well. Our growth numbers uh, are still okay, knock on wood, that they don't go down uh, too much. Um, our budget situation is comparatively okay. Our debt to GDP ratio is comparatively good. Um, our labor markets are stable and improving actually. Uh, and uh, more than anything else, uh, the center of attraction is that we have a modern and innovative manufacturing sector. Uh, I also have a few numbers which I think tie in very well with the ones that you gave. 60% uh, of our manufacturing sector in Germany are medium to high tech products. Uh, whereas and some of our competitors, actually 60% are low to medium tech, so we're on the upper end. Um, about 45% of the value added uh, inside the German economy is research intensive. 85% um, of the researchers in Germany actually work in manufacturing. Um, and the European Commission uh, puts out an R&D investment scoreboard of uh, companies that uh, do well in R&D. And in 2010, out of the top 10 in Europe, uh, five were Germans. VW was the, the best overall. Um, and uh, of the other four in the top 10, there were Siemens, Robert Bosch, and uh, Bayer companies. I'm, I'm sure that you all know. Um, so. This, this innovative strength in our manufacturing sector is the, the key to our success on, on global markets. Uh, we're able to sell wherever there's demand. Uh, German companies participate and we sell to the emerging markets uh, where demand is growing quickly and we sell into areas um, that reflect global growth trends, namely energy efficiency, transport, urbanization, and health. So it's not only made in Germany that's a, a mark of good quality nowadays, it's also invented in Germany. Um, and to add to all that, another thing that is the source of some uh, attention, we have a, a qualified workforce that uh, makes all this uh, possible for companies. Now, people say, oh, Germany is great in many aspects. Of course, it leads to great expectations. And I can just go aside from the innovation for a second. Sometimes it leads to expectations which are a bit high. One is solve the euro issue. Just solve it. It's a problem for us. Solve it. Um, to that, we always say, like any other country, we have some policy dilemmas, too, that we need to deal with. And we need to think of our uh, constituents. Thank you. Um, another one uh, that we hear is, um, pardon me for a sec. Um, uh, it's good that you're saving uh, money, that you're doing fiscal consolidation, but make your fiscal consolidation, uh, make it less ambitious. Spend more now to help the world economy get out of uh, the difficulties that it's in. <clears throat> well, to that we say, uh, we, we do believe in consolidating fiscally, uh, but we're doing it in a growth-friendly way. And R&D is a key element of that growth-friendliness. Uh, you know, we, we do have a constitutional amendment that forces us to have a balanced budget by 2016. Um, <clears throat> but within that framework, from uh, 2010 to 2013, uh, we're actually bringing fresh money, 12 billion, for research and education. So for all those things that um, make us competitive, make us attractive, maybe for some of those reasons <clears throat> that you came here. Now, what is it that differentiates us? I'm keen to hear. It may have something to do with long-term planning. It may have something to do with the interplay between government um, 
uh, business sector and research institutions. It may have something to do with uh, setting long-term goals and strategies. Uh, an interesting one that I should mention is our nuclear phase-out. We're phasing out nuclear energy by 2022. At the same time, we have ambitious climate goals, so we will have to be innovative on uh, energy use and energy production. Uh, with that, I'll leave it, and uh, thank you very much, and pass the floor back to you, Dr. Atkinson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Joanne Halpern, uh, to make the introductions of our speakers. Joanne is the director of the German Center for Research and Innovation in New York City. If you haven't seen that group, I encourage you to look at what they do. Uh, she has a long background in Germany um, and was also uh, 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 has an MA in Germanic languages and has uh, spent a fair amount of time in Germany. So with that, Joanne. Thank you, Rob. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give a brief introduction of our speakers. Our first speaker will be Mr. Engelbert Bayer, who has been with the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, also known as BMBF or BMBF, since 1989, when he joined the, their division of, for R&D policy. In 2005, he became the head of BMBF's Innovation Policy Division. And in this capacity, he was involved in planning and coordinating the German high-tech strategy. Can you hear me okay? It's okay. In 2009, he was appointed head of the Innovation Strategies Directorate. Uh, Dr. Jan Wessels, whom you also can see here on the screen, uh, has worked at the BMBF um, since 2010 in the Innovation Policies Issues Division. He is responsible for the implementation of the high-tech strategy and international aspects of innovation strategy. Prior to joining the BMBF, Dr. Wessels worked as a consultant in the field of innovation policy and he was also a consultant to the German ministries, a number of German ministries, as well as the European Commission in the area of innovation. Um, Dr. Anke Helwig, who is here to my left, has been the senior manager of Fraunhofer headquarters since 1997. She also worked as a program manager at Fraunhofer, in initiating their transatlantic fellowship program, as well as the Bessel Research Award, which is presented by Fraunhofer, as well as the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation to distinguished scholars and scientists. Dr. Helwig is also a material scientist by training and has published primarily on solid state phase transformations at high temperatures. Uh, Dr. William Hartmann, to my left here, is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Fraunhofer USA Incorporated. In this capacity, he manages the business of the corporation, including guiding the strategic development and growth of the Fraunhofer centers in the United States and expand the cooperation between the Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany and the academic, state, federal, and industrial partners in the United States. He also teaches at Johns Hopkins University as a professor of mechanic and material science. And as a senior economist, Dr. Gregory Tassi specializes in the economics of innovation, technology-based economic growth policies, and R&D program impact analysis at the National Institute of Standards and Technology here in Washington, DC. Dr. Tassi has published 35 articles in policy and economic journals. The most recent of his four books is entitled The Technology Imperative. And in his role as senior analyst at ITIF, Stephen Ezel focuses on innovation policy, international information technology competitiveness, trade, and manufacturing and services issues. Together with Dr. Rob Atkinson, he co-authored the book, The Global Race for Innovation Advantage and Why the U.S. is Falling Behind, which will be available in 2012. Um, prior to this, um, Mr. Ezel was affiliated with Peer Insight, an innovation research and consulting firm he co-founded in 2003, and he's also worked for the NASDAQ stock market. Now I uh, give the floor to Mr. Bio. Yes, thank you very much for having us here on the screen. Thank you very much for hearing to what we might have to contribute to your conference. Um, I myself spent several 
great times and what an it's pleasure for me to talk to you today. So please indicate me if you understand you are. And if there's any problem, I'm speaking too fast or you cannot follow, please uh, give me a sign or something like, like that. So is everything okay so far? Yes, yes. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. So, it's a, it's a pleasure for me uh, to talk to you about innovation policy in, in Germany. You already heard that we think that we see some very good figures for uh, about the German economy and about the situation uh, of um, the innovative capacity of, of German companies on world markets and European markets. And um, um, first of all, I would like to stress that uh, quite obviously uh, this is an achievement uh, of, the, of companies themselves um, who um, did a lot in the last 15 to 20 years to restructure and to gain competitiveness, to, to gain ground in the competitive rates um, and to gain ground on technology market. But we think as well that there is a room for, for government, that there is um, a very important role for government to play in this, um, in this area. And uh, this is, um, first of all, I think underlined by the very high interest companies and business associations in Germany place on discussions and contacts and dis uh, discussion forums uh, with government just to figure out what might be appropriate role and what might be appropriate policies. I would like to talk today about three topics. I think you'll see the first slide right now. The first topic is a high tech strategy which sounds something frightening, a strategy by a government. It is more or less a bundle of policies we have in place to create a more favorable environment for companies to, to innovate. And I'm happy to tell you something about these, um, these policies, which we hope and we think are set up in a something coherent uh, way. And we think the set of policies we call high-tech strategy is the right answer to competitive challenges in the area of technology. I would like to make a second point and talk to you about the German Mittelstand, small and medium-sized companies, which quite obviously play a very important role um, in, um, in this area. They play a very important role when it comes to competitive advantages of an economy. And as a third point, I would like to talk to you about cooperation an exchange of policy ideas, and uh, I think uh, between the US and Germany, we have some very interesting fora there, and we have, some, have had some very interesting discussions in, in recent months and years. So first of all, I would just like, like to turn to the German high-tech strategy. Next slide, please. Quite obviously, the competitive challenge is uh, obvious uh, to everybody of us it's uh, the new competitors we see the new competitors in the brick company in the brick states uh, we see increasing investments in r&d in a lot of parts of, of the world uh, r&d and innovation policy is targeted in countries like china and, and brazil uh, as uh, as a means to to gain new welfare in these countries and quite obviously, this poses a lot of challenges on international markets, onto multinational companies which are located traditionally in your country and, um, and in, in Germany. This means there's more competitive pressure. Uh, this means there's global um, competition. And this means there's uh, increasing demand for a coherent strategy in order to tackle these, uh, these challenges. Uh, we think the high-tech strategy is the right answer. Um, because, uh, as, as I tried to explain, offers something like a coherent set of, of policies. And uh, I will talk about that. Next slide, please. The situation really in the last years uh, was characterized by increasing investment in, um, in R&D. Uh, Mr. Fisher already um, laid out that there is uh, an increasing investment of 12 billion by the federal government. Uh, we um, see at the same time increasing investments by, by companies. Uh, we have the situation that we reached a share of 2.8% of 
um, RIP investment as a share of uh, GDP. Um, this is a number which is not satisfying yet. We want to reach 3%, and uh, this is laid out in the German and European innovation strategies as a major, major goal. Uh, much of this money went into the science system, which I will not talk about here today. The science system quite obviously is the underpinning of the um, innovative ecosystem. We had different initiatives here on the way, which are quite important and which in our perspective help to revive uh, and the science system and to give the science system new life. But I will not talk about that. I will talk about that instead. I will talk instead about the innovation in the strategy. Here we have three major approaches to increase uh, uh, the innovative environment for, um, for companies, three major approaches of government policy. You see, um, I think, I don't know what slide to see right now. It's now a slide which is called object, Objectives of the High-Tech Strategy, because I can't see what slide we have right now. Yes, we have it for you. Okay, then we see on the left side, you see um, the first goal of the innovation strategy, which is to establish lead suppliers and to create lead marks. This is uh, the headline for the targeted um, approaches in, in the field of innovation uh, policy. Uh, here we address different sectors, we address demands. Um, here we see the mission oriented uh, uh, approaches to innovation uh, policies. I will talk about that later. Then we have the second big approach in the middle. These are, uh, this is a set of policies where we try to bridge gaps between the science and side and uh, the economy the companies. We have initiatives here on the way, like uh, leading edge cluster competitions, uh, innovation alliances, uh, validation programs, and a bundle of programs uh, to support small and medium sized enterprises, um, mainly in cooperation again uh, with the science side. And we have on the, right, on the right side to see the third big approach in our innovation policy in the high tech strategy, uh, which is about improving framework conditions uh, for companies, for the uh, uh, for the enterprises uh, on their way to increase their innovative uh, performance. Here we talk about um, funding of innovation, startups, tax laws, and so on. Uh, I will talk about first. Um, we talk first about the left. The first approach, which is the targeted uh, research and innovation policy. Next slide, please. We concentrate our research and innovation policies uh, on five big fields of action. Um, so we target uh, climate and energy research, health and nutrition, mobility, security, and um, communication, the communication area. So these are the fields where most industrialized countries have some strengths and uh, which are targeted by most industrialized uh, countries. Inside these fields, we target on, on areas uh, which we feel where there is a very high dynamic in, in, uh, in science and technology, where there are already some strengths in the German system, and where there is an overriding social need, where there is an increasing demand. One big example for this is the energy area. As was already mentioned um, before, Germany decided to phase out um, the atomic energy uh, in this year. So there's a big demand for a coherent policy uh, which uh, sets up new energy systems, which sets up new systems of renewable energies instead, and which requires big investments, for example, in smart grids, new forms of, uh, of networks uh, for electric supply, and so on. So all of this, quite obviously, um, asks for big research efforts just in order to make the necessary technology available. So this is an um, example for this targeted uh, policy, an energy framework program, an energy research framework policy was issued uh, just uh, some months ago, uh, which was coordinated and um, 
uh, which was coordinated between uh, different ministries, which were uh, encompass all policy areas uh, from economic policy, from research policy, uh, to uh, environmental policy, to transport policy, uh, which have a role to play in this area. So this uh, framework program encompasses all of this, um, all of these aspects. Uh, what is important here? Although this is a certain sort of mission-oriented research, although this is tied to this research, uh, the different responsibilities of markets and government elections um, are always paid respect uh, to. Uh, so we fund projects until a certain point uh, where the market should step in. Uh, we are convinced that uh, it is necessary uh, to uh, bring technologies up to a point where companies can, uh, can take over. But we think at the same time that we have an obligation uh, to do this. And um, that there's a, a need in uh, some areas as well for a more systemic um, approach. This means uh, that uh, there are some technology areas which are characterized by network effects. So different actors at the same time they have to uh, move, they have to invest, they have to coordinate their, uh, uh, their activities, and it's an obligation of the government um, to create platforms just to do this. I mentioned the electric sector, sector one point in case, um, sorry, one, other, one other point in case here is electric cars, uh, where such a platform was set up just in order to keep competitive advantage of the German manufacturing companies in, uh, in this um, area. But to be rightly understood, the decisive line between what is the duty of the government, what is the place for government investment, and uh, where companies have to step in is always paid respect to. But this is um, discussed in a very friendly and uh, mutually understanding environment and uh, atmosphere. and. Uh, in principle, there is not much discussion in Germany between the government side and the private company side uh, about uh, this policy approach. We have very high consensus uh, in this um, area. So the same is true for all the other uh, uh, targeted um, areas which I uh, showed you on this uh, on this slide: um, mobility, security, communication. Um, it always has to be figured out in uh, in detail. What is the right approach for uh, for each of this uh, each of these missions, um, for each of these global challenges? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. It's up. Okay. Now I turn to the right, uh, where uh, the third uh, major approach of the German innovation strategy, which was called framework uh, conditions. Here we feel that. Um, um, there are a number of framework conditions which are especially crucial for innovative competitiveness, which are especially crucial for com companies to have an environment in which they can um, achieve um, advantages. So I will only turn to uh, the right side here, which is standardization. Um, We think that a lot of system technologies, uh, which are especially important in these days, standardization plays an increasing, increasing role. Uh, there are standards which are obligatory, uh, set by the, by, the, by the government. There are standards which are set up always by, by a group of companies, uh, market standards, uh, which uh, are, are in, in, in competition to, to each other. But quite obviously, there's room here uh, to um, increase the question of standards very, 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 very early, for example, in research and development programs, just in order to give companies and public research institutions uh, a possibility to be successful in the, in the battle or in the fight for successful standards. And um, so this is one example for one area of the framework conditions uh, which uh, gained a lot in importance in, in recent years and will be more and get important. We pay a very, very careful eye, for example, in this area. The same holds true for all the other fields of framework conditions that you see on this slide, innovation funding, um, policies uh, to create better environments for startups, um, 
uh, intellectual property, of course, quite obviously. Um, and um, of course, the tax law is crucial in, in different aspects uh, here. And we pay attention uh, to that as, as well on all, on all levels, on the level of the of the Chancellor's Merkel, as well as in, in a lot of, uh, lot of work to, uh, um, to create more favorable tax law uh, for, for companies, which not, does not always mean um, um, lowering tax payments, but uh, to create a tax law which uh, allows the, the right investment. So next slide, please. Now I come to the uh, German Mittelstand, which is an example for the second big approach uh, within the high-tech uh, high uh, strategy. We feel that uh, the German Mittelstand uh, is the, uh, the pillar of, uh, of success for, uh, for uh, the German manufacturing uh, sector, especially the uh, production sector is characterized mainly by, uh, by small and medium-sized uh, uh, companies. And, um, um, so the question is, how can we follow up a policy to make life for these companies easier, to, um, uh, to um, give them an even more favorable environment? Um, so in all of the discussion circles, little little stand, representatives of small and medium-sized uh, companies, they play a crucial uh, role, and we try to listen very carefully where they are and it's, um, uh, then it, uh, and a lot of studies uh, which are underway here in the IMW study um, design uh, um, the strength of this uh, of this uh, company. Next slide, please. When it comes next slide. When it comes to research and uh, innovation and uh, the support for research and innovation in these companies, uh, we have um, again four major approaches here. Um, we have um, from um, the right to the left. Of course, the support for startup funding, um, which uh, are schemes which are a little bit similar to what you might have in, in the US. We are um, very um, proud uh, to have very successful cluster initiatives uh, in, in this area. Um, these cluster initiatives are run mainly by, by competition. We run for, uh, uh, we ask for appraisals, um, um, we run call for tenders uh, for, for, successful cluster initiatives and uh, give the winners support. Um, so this is a bottom-up approach where clusters form themselves. We give incentives for clusters to, to form themselves. Uh, the leading edge cluster is uh, an example um, uh, for this approach. Then um, we run a lot of uh, um, not a lot of what we run, um, I think uh, decent fair share of support schemes for R&D in uh, small and medium sized companies under the headline of the um, Center Innovation uh, Program, the ZIM program, uh, where we mainly create networks, uh, or we fund networks um, uh, of um, companies, small and medium sized companies together with, uh, with public research institutions. And on the left side, we see, you see the Kami KMU Innovative, there we ask small and medium-sized companies to participate in our mission-oriented research programs and to give them a fair share of the money and a fair, fair role here. So we increase the money we invested in this four approaches uh, to 1 billion euros uh, over the last uh, five years, um, which is not too much. The share of uh, money we invest uh, as public support in small and medium-sized enterprises is, I think, uh, smaller than uh, what you invest in, in the US. But we do it by this um, by this four uh, programs. We have no we have no um, tax credit for small and medium-sized companies in place in Germany right now. So this means uh, that the overall <coughs> government money which goes into support of small and medium-sized enterprises is uh, less than in uh, most other OECD countries. Uh, overall, the, so, the money the federal government gives into you know, the economy is smaller, as well as the share of uh, governmental R&D, the government R&D budget 
as a share of the overall R&D budget in Germany is smaller than uh, what um, is invested for in, in the US, for example, which has to do something with the uh, defense sector, but nevertheless. Um, but uh, we, we feel that um, the approach we follow here is not bad. And the main characteristic of this approach is uh, that we try to integrate these companies in very dense networks with public research laboratories. We'll hear about Crown of later on, uh, but this is only one case in point. There are other uh, networks which are very, very important. And by doing this, we allow the people in these companies uh, to gain access to the newest knowledge and to uh, the best practice available at uh, different, uh, different places. Um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. I will skip the next slide. Next slide, please. And this slide highlights uh, what I said just uh, just before: cooperation between industry and research uh, institutions is of major uh, major importance. Yeah. Next slide, please. Cooperation between um, companies and uh, too far. One step, please. Yes. On that, please. Previous one. Okay, so this is what I, I, I would like to stress and uh, uh, in this uh, conference is networking is uh, uh, crucial. <laughs> okay, can you go please uh, four slides back, no, two, three slides back? This one, yes. Okay, so this is the main point I would like to, uh, to make. Networking is of crucial importance here. And, um, um, you can give incentives for research institutions and for companies to network just by run competitions. You can give incentives by creating platforms or for example, internet platforms. Uh, you can uh, give incentives by, uh, by um, organizing workshops and, and conferences in uni emerging fields. We do that. Uh, you can uh, create networks uh, on a regional level, which is very important because a lot of uh, cooperation and uh, communication in newly emerging fields goes on in regions. We know that from innovation research, but of course you can do it as well on, on the sectoral level. Uh, so, uh, so networking is, uh, is a crucial point in our, our view. Preconditions for uh, success are, of course, the qualified workforce. I will not talk about that. You already heard something about uh, that. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the ability of the research of the research sector of the science system itself to cooperate and to communicate, and uh, the willingness to take up the challenge of cooperating with, uh, with companies. We invested a lot of efforts uh, in our science system uh, to um, uh, to give better possibilities and to give more incentives to cooperate in their own interests. Uh, with, uh, with companies, and we think that we made some progress uh, there. So we we'll skip the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Oops. Um, so we have. Uh, um, so I would say some last words about uh, cooperation. Um, we had some very two very interesting innovation conferences between uh, the US side and Germany, between the national academies and uh, the German research um, institutes. Um, and um, what came up in our view here is um, that the innovation system of, of Germany and the innovation system of, um, of the US um, are probably characterized by a lot of similarities, but as well a lot of uh, really important uh, differences, with, which might be important to, to notice. It's quite obviously not okay uh, to take one point in time and to argue that, uh, in principle, all characteristics of one system or the others are better or less. I remember the staying in your country some years ago, and at that time the situation in Germany was pretty bad. 
Uh, so um, obviously there are some not only business cycles but cycles of thinking about um, um, technological competit competitiveness uh, as well. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, very important things we can learn from uh, from the US, especially in the field of venture capital and the field of setting up new companies uh, and the field of uh, creating advantages for cutting edge technologies, uh, creating advantages in the area of consumer oriented technologies. But we really on the other side, the Germany has something to offer in the area of system technologies, in the area of engineering, uh, and in uh, the area of networking research institutions and uh, small and medium sized companies, which might play a crucial role. And we are looking forward to discussing even more in detail with you all these issues. And thank you for your uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think um, we'll go to uh, Dr. Helwig. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here and to have the opportunity to give you a little bit of an overview of Fraunhofer together with my colleague Bill Hartmann. Um, you might have heard that Fraunhofer is a German research organization and you might wonder what, what is so special about it that it um, is part of such an event here. I hope to be able to give you a little bit of an insight to what is special about the Fraunhofer model. Uh, and in the next 15 to 20 minutes, my colleague Bill Hartmann and I will try to um, explain to you what it is about and what are the special features. Uh, Fraunhofer, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft was set up just after the Second World War in Germany in order to restore the German competitiveness, which of course was um, at the ground uh, at that time. So we were set up with a specific mission to do applied research and to meet the needs of public and private enterprises. Um, what do you need to do to maintain a comp competitive edge? You need to um, meet the needs of your customers, um, deploy the latest technologies and respond to dynamic market developments. So I'd like to give you in my second slide an overview of the technologies that we um, focus on. And you see here on the right, um, the Fraunhofer technologies can be grouped into these seven areas. They cover all the engineering sciences and some natural sciences. Fraunhofer consists of 60 institutes. We are a non-profit organization. So you see that um, out of these 60 institutes, there's always a group of five to up to a dozen that um, focuses on one of the uh, technologies on the right-hand side. So there is a, a critical number of researchers that really are dedicated to different aspects of these technologies and these are fields that we work on over many of years and that we really have a lot of experience in. Um, at the moment we have a, a research budget of about 1.65 million and I'll explain a little bit, I, I go into some details of the financial model of Fraunhofer because I think that is essential to understand our success. Um, these fields, the, the technologies that you see are pursued over a number of years, but on the other hand we do have um, key topics of strategic, import, uh, strategic importance that we devote ourselves to in, um, more specifically over a shorter period of time, maybe three to four years. Um, and they are fields that we determined as um, being in the pre-competitive <coughs> area and being important for Fraunhofer to create some proprietary intellectual property in order to be, um, to be at the latest state of the art for our industry customers. And I'd like to share these with you in the next slide. Um, the latest uh, strategy process in Fraunhofer uh, came up with these Fraunhofer markets beyond tomorrow, we call them. Um, and you see here low, low loss generation distribution and use of electricity, affordable health, recycling of materials in production, low emission reliable 
mobility and disaster prediction and management. Uh, you might note that these tie in very closely what you, to what you heard earlier about the German high-tech strategy. And of course, that is not a coincidence. There's a number of um, different um, measures and instruments by which industry research and the research ministry or the government cooperate. And um, one example, I'd just like to illustrate this with one example, that is the Industry Science Research Alliance. Um, the Industry Science Research Alliance is a committee that engages actively in shaping the German innovation landscape and representatives from research organizations, industry and the government, the research ministry, uh, come together to discuss uh, issues of strategic importance. You might know that uh, the gentleman in, in the front, in the middle, with the dark glasses, that is uh, president, uh, our president, Dr. Bulling, uh, the president of the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. So um, we engage in discussions under the direction of the German research ministry, but on the other hand, Fraunhofer enjoys a high level of autonomy. The, we receive about 30% of our funding from the research ministry as institutional funding, but this money is at the sole discretion of Fraunhofer management to distribute and to spend on the investments, the research areas that we think are important. And with this, I'd like to come to the, some of the financing behind the Fraunhofer model. Oops. Yep. Uh, here you see the total budget again and how it developed over the past years. And I'd like to focus your attention to the con what is called here contract research area, the 1.4 million. Of course, we have e expansion investments for setting up new institutes or expanding our facility. Oops. Oh, sorry. Oh, there we are again. Yeah. And then we have uh, a number of institutes that work with and for the de defense ministry. But I'd like to focus on the contract research area, those 1.4 million at the lower part. <coughs> and here you see a split up of those. Um, the bottom, the 370 million, are institutional funding. And I said, as I said, this is given to Fraunhofer uh, from the research ministry as a lump sum. We use it for pre-competitive research like the markets beyond tomorrow that were mentioned earlier. And then the important part is the industrial revenue. Here Fraunhofer works really in um, bilateral for industry, commissioned by industry, where we perform research and development projects. And you might notice that this industry re revenue part amounts to about one third of our budget. That is a real critical key performance measure for Fraunhofer. Um, the, this industrial revenue is so important because we have a financial structure that was set, set up in the 1970s as an agreement between the government and Fraunhofer in the so-called Fraunhofer funding model by which for every euro that Fraunhofer earned from industry, we got one matching euro of government funding. And that is how Fraunhofer uh, was able to grow over the years. And that is really the key performance indicator and the driver for our further growth. Um, with this arrangement, I think the government was able to put, um, to put funding for Fraunhofer to where it works most efficiently in commercially viable and relevant projects. And in the next slide, you're going to see how we grew over the past four decades. You see it's quite an impressive and dynamic growth. Um, and the, one of the special features behind it is that the system of the matching euros between the more, the more successful we are in industry research, the more institutional funding we have for pre-competitive research, that is broken down actually into the whole organization. <coughs> So every single institute among the 60 institutes has to, uh, the, the institute director has to balance his or her budget. Um, and the more successful they are in getting contracts from industry, that is a proof of their success, of their viability, of the feasibility, the more, uh, the higher is their share of institutional funding that they get. Um, this breaks down even to the department level and work team level. It's really the one key performance measure that we live by. Um, yeah. So the cooperation with companies is our bread and butter business. And um, it is 
the it's applied in, in each individual institute, but on the other hand, the institute director, each institute director has a high level of autonomy again. So the institute directors can themselves determine what they want to spend their, their money on, which research areas they want to pursue. Um, and we leave it as, as much, much as possible up to them to determine their own strategy. Now let me come to two examples to give you a little bit of an impression of the breadth of uh, Fraunhofer research for and with industry. One is MP3. You might know, hopefully you will know, that the MP3 code was developed by Fraunhofer. Some researchers at the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits developed a number of patterns uh, that uh, all came then into this MP3 coding technology and it is now licensed to over a thousand companies and you can imagine some of the biggest of them, Apple and Microsoft and, and the like, they have um, uh, created some very good licensing revenue for Fraunhofer. So that was a once in a decade big success for us. On the other hand, I'd like to give you one more example, which is where we work with is small and medium sized, a rather very small business. Uh, it didn't work yet. Yep. Um, actually, in this case, um, the Fraunhofer Institute worked with a butcher, a butcher shop, um, where the, the butcher came up with the idea of um, pro producing some low fat sausage. Apparently, there was there was and is demand for that, and he was very <laughs> innovative and entrepreneurial and uh, experimented in his own shop uh, with how to produce such such a sausage. You know, pro in in Germany we like our sausages, so it <laughs> it went well, but did not come up with a consistent quality and did not have quite the same. Um, sensory properties to it as he would have liked it to be. So in this case, he approached the Fraunhofer Institute for uh, Processing and Packaging and they have the necessary manufacturing expertise, professional equipment and the upscaling know-how um, to help him. And the secret of producing the low-fat sausage is uh, to control the temperature very tightly, to control the mixing process and some special ingredients. So they, they filed a patent jointly and the product has actually made it to the market and you can buy it in many of um, the German supermarkets, Edeka in the Edeka chain. So that's another success story. So how do we, um, what do we do to remain technological technologically at the forefront. Of course, uh, one, we have state-of-the-art facilities. Two, we, have, we cooperate very closely with universities. And three, we are internationally very active. And my, my colleague Bill Hartmann will tell you more about our international activities, specifically here in the US. But before that, I'd like to briefly go into our cooperation with universities, because that is another key feature of Fraunhofer. Um, the important thing is that whenever we uh, appoint a new institute director, we do that in agreement with the local university, usually a technical university. So there's this dual appointment, and that makes a, a very close relationship, as you can imagine, and it's beneficial to both sides. On the one hand, our institute directors um, work very closely with students, they can supervise PhD theses and diploma theses, um, they can recruit talent, they find out wh where are the right people to join the Fraunhofer Institute. On the other hand, it is advantages for the universities because they, um, uh, they get more uh, topics of practical relevance into their cur curriculum and they can use some of the Fraunhofer equipment uh, cost-intensive equipment that they might need in third-party projects. And um, what might uh, need to be mentioned as well, we work very closely with universities in regional clusters where we set up a cluster initiative together with large and small companies, usually along the value chain, with universities and with Fraunhofer all in one regional area, in an area where we want to strengthen what is already there in economic development and make that even bigger. So my last slide is just a summary of the main points and with this I'd like to hand over to Bill Hartmann. Mark, I only have two minutes left. Oh 
Great. I'm always fat free. I'm always fascinated by the food processing application. I can assure you that the next invention that my front offer will not be non-fat beer. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my first slide is a statement of some of the essentials of Front Offer USA. Uh, it's important for me to point out that um, we are nonprofit 501c3. Uh, it's also important to know that we started in 1994. And since that time, we've developed uh, applied research centers in the United States that are associated directly with eight Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany. And we also collaborate with a few other institutes besides that. But, you know, eight out of 60, uh, there's plenty of expansion possibilities. With respect to the second paragraph, I'd like to make a comment about business experience in our centers. Uh, one of the reasons that we were able to have stability and sustainability in our, in our research is the fact that every research center has either a director and, and also headquarters as officers who have experience uh, in a startup, uh, in a small business, big business, uh, or serving on the board or boards of directors of, uh, of public corporations. So they bring a perspective that is the real world perspective. And that has a lot to do with uh, their ability to get uh, research contracts from, from both industry and government. And the last paragraph here talks about uh, our international, international exchange you know, the, that consists of ideas, services, but also students. And in fact, the student uh, exchange, we have about 70 interns a year in our centers uh, in the United States and several people going to Germany and other countries as well. This slide is, uh, is important because it's, it puts a lot of information in one place. So, the, Dual use, of course, is, some, is, a, is a term that's been around for 25, 30 years. We do leverage our government research contract by finding ways of, of interesting, of getting uh, co companies interested in the technology. We have consortia. I'll give you an example of this towards the end. And our consortia building is kind of like a virtual clustering where you can have many companies associated with a particular center uh, working in a particular discipline. In our, in our business-oriented operation, more than 75% of our research contract funding comes from, uh, from the industry and government. It's earned. It's not, it's not a donation. And centers are managed as profit centers, much like the institutes are in Germany. That is to say that uh, there is considerable autonomy uh, in, these, in these centers. My primary job is to look out for the fact that we have a $50 million budget, nine locations in five states, and 200 employees have to make sure that we stay out of jail. And that everything that we do is perfectly legitimate within our 501c3 and that we have a good relationship with both our partners, the governments, and industry. I just might add, with respect to the nine locations in five states, uh, I'm a multi-talented guy, but Joanne gives me too much credit. I haven't taught at Johns Hopkins in 35 years, but that's a, if I were doing that as well as, as looking out for those nine locations, I think that would be quite remarkable. But, uh, the public service, of course, the education aspect of that is something that I already mentioned. We have a lot of interns that spend on an average of six months a year at one of our research centers, and <clears throat> that helps with respect to the exchange. Next slide. This is important because it emphasizes again the fact that we are about 50 percent of our of our contract research funding comes from from outside of base funding comes from industry and, and the other 50 percent comes from governments both federal and state. Our base funding which is 23 percent of our entire budget 
consist of donations from Fraunhofer, uh, private sector, states, state governments, and, and also uh, some uh, universities. Most of the university contributions, of course, are in kind in terms of space or faculty time. This is a list of our centers. Um, as you can see, they're, they're quite diverse with respect to specialty, laser technologies, manufacturing innovation, coatings. The coatings right now is focusing on synthetic diamond, experimental software engineering, which is located at the University of Maryland, uh, molecular biotech, digital media technologies, which is associated with the Institute in uh, Erlangen, which invented the MP3. And our newest center is the Sustainable Energy Systems, and we have a new startup uh, representing the Heinrich Kurtz Institute, which is in Boston, uh, on, with the emphasis on medical and security technologies. Uh, these are our universities that we have partnerships with or collaborations with. The ones up there that we have collaborations with, well, actually, it's they're all partners with the exception of Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins is a, is a collaborator. The others are now partners with an institute, or with a center. You've seen this in many places, I'm sure. This is the old, you know, getting across the valley of death. This is what we believe we do well. And we do it not only because we can, we can construct the bridge, but we can construct the bridge with multi-disciplines. We have the capability of being able to select the particular group, the particular team that you need to take a specific technology to a specific commercialized commercialization market and and that is one of the one of the strengths if we don't have it in the US we can certainly find it in Germany since there are 60 research institutes there um, and we can always look for that extra knowledge and expertise uh, to put together the appropriate team to create that bridge uh, we also have a formal program called tech bridge which not only provides the uh, technical expertise, but also links with venture capitalists to, heart, to help startups uh, get technologies that are licensed, uh, get them started. And this is actually originated out of our Center for Sustainable Energy Systems in, uh, in Boston. Two examples. One example which has been around, I mean, I, I could give you many examples. I had to select two. So I selected one that's been it's been around for a while. We started developing this uh, vaccine production from plants in about 2002. And several years ago, working together with our Center for Manufacturing Innovation at Boston University, we devised this vaccine factory concept, which is, is a uh, completely automated process of from planting the seeds all the way to harvesting the, uh, the end product, which is a protein that's used to make the vaccine. Um, we have an industrial partner. That industrial partner was brought on board very early in the process, back in the, the end of 2003. So before many of the patents were, were even disclosed, before uh, anything was proven beyond 50%, we were able to get a partner. That relationship, as an example here, has netted us over $20 million in uh, additional support coming from most of it from the industrial partner. And our investment in base funding back in the first couple years was about $200,000. More importantly, or equally as important, it has generated about 85 additional jobs at that research center, which is our largest center now. Uh, located in, in Newark, Delaware. Yes. Oh, three minutes? Oh, thank you. So this is an example that's most, more recent. This is our one of our interns in our, in our uh, facility in, in Cambridge, where he had, this past year developed a, a tool for, for basically uh, non-destructively testing the extent of uh, um, uh, curing of, a, of, a, of EVA that's used in, in so making solar panels. And this is being licensed now, uh, still in negotiations, but it's approximately a $200 million opportunity for a licensee. And we've spent $172,000 to develop this. 
Um, we have consortia. This is an example of one, thanks to the Department of Energy support and Building America program. Uh, we basically will be involved in this for three years. And it's important to note that there are two front offer institutes involved, the Solar Energy Institute and the Building Physics Institute, as well as university, many large companies and many small companies, which is the type of exchange interaction <laughs> of ideas and capabilities that, that allows us to go forward. Um, my final slide, which is to remind me to, to say a few things besides just quoting this, but you know, successful competitiveness results from the distinction of functionality and or cost. Distinction results from innovation. Innovation requires imagination and ability. I pause right there. Many of you have probably heard the, 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 the quote uh, that uh, innovation is a lot or a little of, of imagination, a lot of perspiration. Do, do you know who made that? Who said that? Edison. Edison, yes. And of course, Edison was a very, very hard worker. But it's interesting because the amount of perspiration is inversely proportional to the ability. So the more ability you have, the more multidiscipline capabilities you have, the quicker you can get things out of the laboratory and to market. And so even though imagination and ability are the essence, the extent of each it, it makes a big difference. And of course, you have to encourage it. How do you encourage imagination? It's very difficult to encourage imagination in a one-on-one. -on -one. You encourage imagination by group meetings, by people thinking out of the box, by people having discussions, looking at it from a perspective that's different from yours, and then it gives you an idea. And then, of course, the other thing is to improve ability, which means you never stop learning. You learn from education, you learn from experience, and as long as you promote learning and provide an environment for imagination, I think that uh, innovation results. And it certainly has been our experience where, uh, and, and perhaps it all comes down to people. You have to have the right people. And of course, the motivation for these people is that they're not being handed a budget and saying, go out and do this. They have to find it themselves, but they have a nice base to work with to keep them going. It's the same, same model as the model in Germany. And uh, we look forward to, to continued growth and to continued uh, association with both our parent institutes as well as uh, the industries that we interface with. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I've been asked to encourage those of you in the back to come up and occupy these seats in the front of the room. Uh, that way you get the full blast of my forthcoming rant against U.S. innovation policy. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, begin by stating a few of the characteristics, as I see them, uh, of current policy. Um, the vast majority of federal R&D is focused on public missions, defense, energy, health, security, space, so on. Uh, in fact, by my rough estimate, about 90% of the federal R&D budget goes to these mission-oriented R&D agencies. <clears throat> and 80% is so targeted to just defense. Can you listen to the mic? No. Oh. There are hearing you. OK. Thank you. Um, so 80 percent focuses just on defense and health. Now, there's obviously diffusion of technical knowledge coming out of those programs, but once you set as your target a, an economic growth objective, for example, one of our current ones is to revitalize U.S. manufacturing, you need a sector-wide strategy uh, but when you fund most of your R&D along silos, which are the missions of uh, the majority of, of federal R&D spending, you get 
redundancy in some cases and gaps in, the, in, in other. Um, in fact, I'm currently uh, co-chair of a White House committee that's charged with coming up with some manufacturing sector-wide policies. And it's been a struggle um, along a number of dimensions, but uh, we are working on it, which is the positive news. Um, the underlying conceptual problem here is the continued adherence in this country to what I call the black box model. In that model, government basically funds science, and then they step aside and they, they expect the market forces to do all the rest. Uh, this doesn't provide the decision criteria for the whole range of conceivable policy instruments that are at the disposal of any government in the world. So uh, the model itself and the underlying philosophy is probably our single uh, biggest hang-up. <clears throat> So the one positive uh, thing I can say here is that we're finally beginning to look beyond the narrow scope of our past policy focus, which has been really science and then innovation, although even with respect to innovation, we, we basically assume that it happens if the, uh, the science base is, is provided by government. So uh, what I argue is that the the policy scope should really be science, technology, innovation, and diffusion, or STID policy. I tried to make that stud, but I couldn't find anything to start to do. Um, the D in STID is particularly important for this country because we largely ignore it. And this is in spite of admonitions from industry leaders like Andy Grove of Intel. He wrote a frequently cited um, op-ed in Business Week in which he complained about the failure of this country to pay attention to scale, which clearly um, our German colleagues are, are not guilty of. So uh, the bottom line is we've been underinvesting in R&D in its totality uh, and the related economic assets. So this is uh, evidenced by a long list of economic indicators. Uh, in a short time I have, I can list a few. but. First, I want to start at the, the sort of uh, ultimate broad level, um, which is Let's do the next slide. The next slide. Uh, the wavy lines, dashed lines here are yeah, I'm on. the wavy dash lines are the business cycle. Uh, these are fluctuations in economic activity about a long-term growth track, which is the solid blue lines. Uh, you cannot turn on your TV, pick up a newspaper, even walk down the hall and talk to someone uh, in this country and in Europe without getting the current set of disputes over how much monetary policy, how much fiscal policy. But the fact is that both monetary and fiscal policy are uh, short-term in nature. They're designed to smooth out the fluctuations in the business cycle along that long-term growth track. What determines the long-term growth track is very different, and that's the structural asset set that technology is the prime mover behind. So um, our job then is to ask what drives the, the long-term growth track, and in particular the slope of the blue line that I just showed. And another symptom of our problem is that with this focus on science, the National Science Foundation for decades collected almost nothing but R&D data. They could give you breakdowns in every way, shape, or form, but they had nothing to say on the output side until very recently. So they have finally started an innovation survey. Uh, the first data that was released is reflected here. I took that data for 17 industries and I created a crude index of innovation, basically adding product and process innovations for each industry together. And you can see that there's a very definite uh, positive correlation. Uh, the three yellow markers are service industries. The blue ones are manufacturing. Uh, the outlier, which is the question everyone all wants to know, what's that one upper right-hand corner? That's software, which I actually do not consider to be a service uh, anymore. Um, but the dashed uh, red line here at 5% is pretty much the bottom 
of R&D intensity that would allow you to designate uh, an industry as, as R&D intensive. And you can see that many U.S. manufacturing industries are at or below that line. In fact, the average for the U.S. manufacturing sector R&D intensity is 3.7%. So uh, when you have other R&D intensive industries anywhere from six, seven, eight, nine up to 22% uh, in the case of software, um, the average definitely has to be um, brought up. So uh, again, in keeping with my theme that uh, innovation is not the, should not be the sole focus of policy, uh, I t I've taken. Uh, the manufacturing industries and group them into high R&D intensive and low R&D intensive groups. And you can see in the middle column clearly the substantial difference in the average R&D intensities. In the third column is the average real output growth. And after all, that's the ultimate uh, target of innovation or economic growth policy, I should say, because that's when you create the jobs and the profits, which together make value added and add up to GDP. So everyone's growth strategy is ultimately targeted towards making GDP grow. <clears throat> but what have we been doing? Uh, you can see that we had a, a large increase in private investment in hardware and software in the 90s due to the uh, splurge on innovation technology. But in the last decade, the growth rate has dropped dramatically. And this is... Uh, an indication of a very serious problem going forward. <clears throat> so getting back to R&D intensity, uh, f for 50 years, the uh, US R&D intensity has basically gone sideways. Uh, and you know in that period of time that the technology-based global economy has exploded. So uh, we have not reacted to that at the macro level at all. Uh, industry has increased its R&D intensity. As you can see, the blue line has a positive slope, although in the last decade, you will note in the far right, it is leveled off. Um, the, the, the villain here is the federal government, the green line, which has in the 50-year decline. So th this elicits arguments, of course, uh, with more, well, my more conservative economic colleagues, and they say, well, this is just leverage. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> The devil's in the details, and the results don't indicate that the increased ratio of uh, private to public investment is actually working out. <clears throat> so how do we stack up uh, internationally? Um, we used to be the most R&D intensive uh, country in the world. Uh, we're now number seven. Uh, the two countries right behind us, Taiwan and Singapore, uh, are increasing their national R&D at uh, two to three times the rate of the U.S. So by the time OECD upset updates the uh, uh, 2008 data, uh, we'll probably be number nine. Uh, but I will observe for the purposes of discussion, uh, some, to my surprise and probably yours, that if you look, Germany's R&D intensity is slightly uh, lower than ours, uh, yet they are obviously much more successful and uh, when I get to the end, I'm going to have a few comments about this and a few other indicators and what, uh, what it might mean. <clears throat> so uh, what are we doing about it again? Uh, you can see that uh, we rank last in terms of change in R&D intensity. i uh, also point out that uh, Germany is uh, uh, one notch ahead of us. However, uh, and this chart, which comes from the recent ITIF uh, um, small, medium enterprise study, excellent study, I recommend it. Um, we're in about in the middle in the terms of proportion of value added for manufacturing that comes from uh, the, the more R&D intensive uh, end of the distribution. Uh, but but you, you see Germany is, is, is the leader in terms of the proportion of its value added attributable to the uh, R&D intensive uh, a portion of its manufacturing sector, which has been noted by uh, earlier speakers. <clears throat> so, uh, again, to present this in a conceptual form, this is the black box model. Blue in this picture means um, 
a public good and therefore the responsibility of government red means a private good and the responsibility uh, of industry. Uh, so in this model, uh, uh, the science base is a pure public good. No one disputes whether government should fund that. The argument is over the technology box. So if you're a policy analyst and, and you're charged with figuring out ways to, to increase the value added, which again is the ultimate economic growth policy objective, you would work backward and in this model you would find almost no leverage points. <clears throat> so what I've argued for the past 15 years or so is we need to look inside the black box and uh, I have broken technology into three components. What was the black box is now the, uh, the proprietary technologies box. But the two other ones, you notice, are partly blue and partly red. That means they're quasi-public goods. So there's a responsibility of both government and industry to fund uh, these two elements. And this is not arbitrary. These three have very distinctly different investment characteristics, and so they have very distinctly different market failures and hence require distinctly different policy responses. Uh, I don't really have time to explain this anymore, but the characteristics of infotechnologies, uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned the importance of standardization. Infotechnologies are the basis for most industry standards. There are hundreds of standards. The semiconductor industry has 800 standards by one of their several industry associations estimate. And that does not include the standards worked on by other uh, semiconductor industry standards bodies. So. Uh, they're, they're ubiquitous in the entire technology-based economic process, but something that's uh, uh, clearly overlooked. <clears throat> so uh, this is a, a, a way of showing how real this technology element model is. In the black box model, you'd only look at the far left and the far right columns. The middle three would, be, uh, would not exist. But you can see this is the biopharmaceutical industry as an example the wide array of elements that fall into those categories. And, and if you ignore those, what you get is what we are getting, which is a very low productivity in the biopharmaceutical industry by consensus uh, of all the participants in that industry. So if you use this model, you can then um, fine tune your policy uh, set, which means you can pick the market failure more accurately and you can choose the appropriate policy instrument. Uh, this is something that's not done systematically at all in this country. In fact, we don't even have an innovation stood policy infrastructure uh, to do the analysis. If it were for ITF, there would be no organization doing this sort of thing on a regular basis. So, <clears throat> So to wind up, this is just one example of how uh, a more systematic and, and uh, multi-element model leads you to a, a more in-depth and, and accurate view of any single policy target, in this case, R&D. Instead of just talking about how much R&D you should spend, which is one of the three legs of the policy stool here, we have to be much more concerned about the composition um, and the efficiency. And these second two are what are leading to the growing importance of clusters and other forms of, of partnership models. So, um, just as sort of one concluding observation, you know, I've noted that Germany has a lower R&D intensity than the U.S. Uh, amazingly, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics anyway, the, the average uh, hourly um, Man compensation in, in German manufacturing is 39% higher than the U.S. Uh, incredible. They also have a higher corporate tax rate by about 12%. Yet, uh, because they've invested in an extremely highly skilled labor force, and as the previous presentations have indicated, they work very dil diligently on optimizing their industry structure, bringing out the creativity and importance of small, medium enterprises. Uh, they clearly have the full technology life cycle focus, uh, which we do not. And uh, as I indicated, they have a much more R&D intensive manufacturing sector. So I think the bottom line is we have some things to work on. Thank you. <laughs> Good, thank you.
And um, Stephen, um, is Zell just with the last, just a couple of comments, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. Great, thank you to everyone for those excellent presentations. Uh, so now we've had comments on the German high-tech strategy and the U.S. innovation model, and I just wanted to synthesize those with a few comments and observations comparing the two together. So let me offer just five general observational remarks about the German high-tech strategy. Um, first, I think it initially explicitly recognizes that Germany is in quote, an intense international innovation competition, which demand that countries put in place a coherent dynamic innovation policy. Uh, in other words, Germany has put together a game plan to compete and win in the highest base sectors of economic growth. And meantime, in the United States, we have a debate about whether or not countries are really in competition with one another or not. Secondly, I think the German approach is marked by a highly pragmatic, collaborative, consensus-based innovation policy. They fundamentally recognize that if they put in place effective programs to support the competitiveness of their workers and workforce, that will inform the competitiveness of their enterprises and then the competitiveness of their overall economy. So they work together in a very collaborative, sophisticated way. There's broad public uh, consensus across both sides of the aisle in Germany that investments in R&D and innovation are what's driving their country's economic growth. Um, and as was pointed out, uh, this type of collaborative effort is institutionalized in a number of forms, whether it is the fact that in the Fraunhofer Institutes, uh, the chair of the Fraunhofer Institute is a university chair, um, or in this Industry Science Research Alliance. In fact, I don't know if you saw it on one of Engelbert's slides, but a study comparing the by DIW, a consulting firm in Berlin, which will be released in 2012, which will systematically compare the U.S. and German innovation policies, found that Germany's strength in system integration uh, and collaborative network uh, basis was a real strength of theirs over the United States. Um, I think the third point um, is that the German approach recognizes that effective federal innovation policies do indeed have an impact <coughs> on the marketplace. In fact, I encourage you to take a copy of the High Tech Strategy 2020 uh, in the back of the book, uh, in, the, in the back of the room. But on page three, they have a fascinating data point from 2009, which found that about 30% of all German companies attribute their innovations to improved research and innovation policies at the federal level. That's astounding. But what it shows is that smart programs uh, oriented towards public procurement, uh, towards overcoming system coordination failures in an economy, uh, towards deploying ICT and digital platforms can go a long way to incurring, uh, encouraging innovation in businesses. The fourth concept I think is fascinating is that they are showing a willingness, a willingness to experiment with innovative innovation policy, with new instruments and methods. So we didn't hear about the innovation vouchers, but this is a, a new program they have put in place where uh, small SMEs can receive from five to 30,000 euros uh, to uh, solve particular problems in their innovation process. Uh, this, this is a, a program oriented towards very small SMEs. Uh, but we saw it also with uh, the TechBridge program, uh, with the central innovation programs for SMEs, uh, with a new program they have called the Fortunes Campus, uh, this research campus uh, on many German universities campuses, uh, which is designed to bring together uh, universities, nonprofit research institutions, and companies so they can engage in collaborative discussions on uh, a, a medium and long-term basis. The point is uh, they're experimenting with innovative innovation instruments, and they're not afraid of the risk of failure. I think that's fantastic for us to learn from. Uh, the fifth point I want to make is this explicit focus on supporting SMEs. And in particular, they're putting in place significant dollars to support directly the innovation, R&D, and new product development efforts of SMEs. So we heard how those efforts expanded from 500 million euros in 2005 to uh, about 900 uh, million in 2009. And it's also been a target of their stimulus package. So as part of Germany's stimulus package, they put 1.26 billion euros into supporting the innovation efforts of SMEs. Uh, so they're funding this in a very sophisticated way. Uh, 
Um, and then finally, just this overarching point uh, of the approach of these public-private partnerships in the Fraunhofer Institutes, which are focused specifically on getting science to market and forging these public-private partnerships that translate basic scientific discoveries in universities into new process technologies and commercializable products, uh, being uh, bridging that gap between innovation and commercialization. Uh, and lastly, uh, as you'll see in their strategy, if you read through it in depth, uh, they are absolutely unabashed about identifying the key emerging technologies of the future, uh, whether they are in optics, biotechs, nanotechnology, microelectronic systems, and saying Germany must be world leaders in these technologies, and we're going to organize the resources of our society in advancement of that goal. So then what does this tell us about uh, implications for US technology and innovation policy? Uh, I think first off, uh, that a focus on framework or factor conditions will be insufficient uh, to get us to where we need to be. Uh, certainly we have to have the best environment to support innovators in the world from a tax, talent, trade, immigration policy perspective, but as the German presentation showed us, that is not enough. We also have to be concerned about supporting key technologies, supporting cross-cutting technologies, and uh, putting in place these public-private partnerships uh, focused on translational and applied research. Uh, we can't be competitive in industrial uh, technologies unless we have forged those types of, of partnerships in our economy. Uh, of course, uh, as was pointed out by Greg Tassi, um, we are dramatically underfunding uh, federal R&D and innovation efforts. Uh, in fact, if you looked at the growth of federal funding uh, for R&D from 1953 to 1987, it grew by 4.9% a year. Uh, but since 1987, uh, it's only grown by 0.3% per year. So in fact, what you see is that if we were to restore uh, the government's funding for R&D and innovation in the United States to 1987 levels, we would have to invest another $150 billion per year just to get back to the level of investment we had in 1987. And that would fund you know, another eight or nine NSFs, uh, another eight or nine Fraunhofer's. Uh, so you can imagine what we'd be able to do if we were continuing the types of investments that we used to make. So then the final point I want to make is that what we learned from this presentation on the German high-tech strategy from the research Rob and I have done from our forthcoming book, from other countries' uh, innovation programs and policies that we've studied, is that we now see about four dozen countries around the world that not only have formalized national innovation strategies, but also have national innovation foundations or agencies behind them to drive innovation throughout their economy. The US has to have a serious, coherent, dynamic, and ongoing national technology and innovation strategy if we are going to remain competitive into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, all our speakers. And we have about uh, probably about 20 minutes for questions. So I'll just open it up. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, if you can raise your hand, I'm going to do it more or less in order of people I see it. If you can, if there's a comment to a particular person, identify that and also identify yours. I'm going to go right here, ma'am. Uh, you're right there. I just had a question to our German guests, and um, I'm interested in terms of um, uh, the sort of German innovation in high tech manufacturing and medium tech manufacturing. What is the role of, or what, what is the role, as you see it, of um, labor and, and trade unions in this in this uh, growth and innovation? Do, do our colleague in Germany want to take that one? Yes, sir. The role of trade unions in this effort and labor. Well, okay. Okay, that was the question. It was very hard to understand the question. Uh, I think it was what is the role, uh, if any, of trade unions in helping either call, develop or implement or be partners with the innovation strategy in Germany? Okay. Um, First of all, trade unions played a very positive role in recent years by uh, limiting their, um, their demand for rising wages, and so they are to uh, um, the German industry to be competitive on the on price sector. But on the innovation sector uh, as well, they, um, they are one, one, one partner. Um, 
They are important in two or three major sectors, for example, in the chemical industry, in um, uh, the car manufacturing industry, and in this industry, they focus very much on vocational training, on supporting um, uh, to have a very highly qualified workforce. I think that this is their major their major role in the innovation business. Uh, of course, they are part of this uh, innovation alliance, research alliance, which was mentioned. Um, they participate there, and uh, in this research uh, alliance, they stress very much the role of, of services, um, the role of um, business structures. Of um, so, they have a role to play. Uh, they put forth certain arguments in this area. Um, they support the overall policy, but the major role they uh, within. Uh, different sectors and uh, the qualification of the workforce. Great, thank you. Uh, did you have your hand up? You had, go ahead. You're right here. Yeah. Hi, Chris Fall, Office of Naval Research. I have a question for uh, Anke. Uh, specifically, uh, it looked like um, in 2010, for the first time, you dropped an institute, 60 to 59, mm -hmm. which, which raises the que bigger question, uh, the issue of creative destruction. How? Fixed in place is, is Fraunhofer. How often do you mix and match, break things up, rearrange? Mm -hmm. um, and do you, do you anticipate down the road some of the problems of sclerosis we have in our own national lab system, for example? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm not so familiar with the problems you have here with the national lab system, so. <laughs> but let me come to the number of institutes. Problems, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, you, you noticed quite right that the number of institutes was, was higher at a point, and then it was 59 in 2010, and it's now 60 institutes again. Uh, the, the process by which the number of institutes change is, is different. One is we establish institutes, uh, when we feel there is a field in applied research which Fraunhofer does not cover yet and where there is industry demand and where there is market demand. So um, we set up, I think, uh, four or five years ago an institute for immunology um, in the former East Germany in Leipzig, which is doing very well. But uh, many times it also happens that we merge with institutes that are already in existence. And um, there are institutes, for example, that are um, fully or to a large part sponsored with institutional funding by different government agencies or public agencies. And um, if there is a, um, if there's a feeling that they could work better within the Fraunhofer system, it is actually quite an attractive model for both sides because we enlarge and broaden our competencies. And on the other hand, the institutional funding that is put into this institute is 30 uh, percent or 33 percent roughly um, in the long term. So that is how a number of institutes were integrated into Fraunhofer in the recent years and that is why the number fluctuates. Uh, sometimes when there is too much overlap <laughs> or when the market need is not proven after a while, uh, we consolidate by putting two or three institutes together. Great, thank you. Uh, right here and then here and then here, right here. My question is also for Dr. Helvig. I'm Jerome Pichella from the Embassy of Canada. I, you've talked about international cooperation, so I suppose you have an international business unit. Could you describe what they do, their size, just elaborate a bit on that? Yeah. Um, my question might probably not be, uh, not satisfy your, uh, the way you are thinking, because we do have an international business uh, unit. I'm actually part of that. Uh, international business development, but the international business development or the international activities are really um, also um, initiated and uh, forced and implemented by the several by the institutes themselves. So, as I tried to point out, Fraunhofer is a very um, autonomous system, a, a fractal system more or less, where smaller units always try to manage themselves. Um, so, although we have an international strategy and setting up Fraunhofer USA is certainly part of it, 
Um, we do not drive all the international activities, but whenever an institute sees a market, the need to work with a global partner, which some of them are, of course, most, most attractive because they are state-of-the-art, cutting edge, uh, then they just go ahead. And our, um, our task in headquarters is rather to frame the general international strategy and um, to support some activities that we think are of strategic importance. I think uh, you right here, sir. Right here. Uh, David Green, Department of Commerce, NOAA. Um, we have a lot of issues here where we look at uh, the challenge of competitiveness between the government itself and industry. Um, and so we talk about partnerships, we talk about collaboration, but very often here it's you do this and we'll do that. Could you talk a little bit from the Fraunhofer perspective of how you have the true collaboration where the industry side doesn't run into a role of being in competition with the government doing something? Do you understand my question? Here we've had plenty well, of examples yeah. of where government has been can, innovating and gotten in the way of industry sure. versus supporting it. Well, I can answer it from, the, from our perspective as to how we do it in the U.S. Uh, we, we do not have any funding from the government, that it, other than state governments, that is a donation. In other words, all the work we do for the federal government is done under contract, just like any private sector uh, company would be operating, except we're a nonprofit. And the amount of donations that we receive from state governments are all economic development motivated. So the state governments are interested in, in, in providing some, some support because they know that if we're successful, we're going to generate spinoffs and they're going to, there's going to be increased employment in the, in the area. So I, we don't have a major a national lab, for example, is what, 90 percent funded by the federal government. So national lab, and it's not contract research, it's essentially donation. So well, I, think, I think the question is a little more. In the U.S., we tend to look at the government and the business as being inherently in conflict. And in Germany, that may occur, but it seems to me that it's inherently in partnership. And uh, so I don't know, um, uh, maybe Mr. Baer, you can talk about this sort of, there, this sort of, how do you get this partnership political culture in Germany that seems to uh, be so elusive for us? Um. First of all, um, of course, there are always areas of conflicts. For example, uh, I think when talking about Fraunhofer, Fraunhofer, when it comes to some business, some, some projects where they are in competition with pure private companies, then Fraunhofer steps back. So, markets and should address markets where it is not in competition with. Uh, with private companies which, which will, do not get the base um, financing. Um, coming to this other question of the culture of cooperation, then I think there was a process of learning in, in recent years. Companies and um, research institutions, they learn that there are models of cooperation which, which just work. And so uh, this is a Yes, a lot. This learning procedure yes, to come to the point where we are right now. And of course, there were all, always failures as well. So we learned about uh, models which didn't, which didn't work, and where we stepped back uh, over time. And so uh, we are now as well in the process of learning when we create new instruments, uh, this new thinking about a more mission-oriented uh, approach to uh, research and innovation policy. There as well, we, we take steps forward and we observe carefully what works and uh, what, uh, what doesn't. But overall, there's feeling in, in the business side, on the business side and on the government side, that in principle, this is a sensible way to do. And um, what is very, very important, that this way, Corporate on the research side doesn't interfere with the marketplace. So um, companies who participate in uh, pre-competitive uh, research alliances might compete very fiercely, and 
on, uh, on the marketplace. And uh, what is important uh, here is that um, we really address issues uh, which are a step, which should stop a step before the marketplace, so that uh, there's no danger that competition is hit or something like that. So it's a logic process. Great, thank you. So I think we have time for two more questions, uh, which we have a lot. We have a lot of hands. So maybe uh, this gentleman here had his hand up, and then we'll go back. I'm sorry. Um, so, this is actually based on a comment that one of my friends made recently, that since reunification, most of the MPIs have been in the East, not up to and I. How has the Fraunhofer's and the uh, overall German Mattelstadt program like, adjusted itself to the uh, national priorities of bringing the East up to the West? i.e. have more front offers been located in the east, for example, than in the west? You're talking about the time after unification. Yes, over the last 20 years. Yes. Yeah, actually, um, I think Fraunhofer did a, that was before my time, but it was Fraunhofer did a very good job in um, identifying the opportunities in former East Germany very early on and uh, finding out which of the existing universities and academies of sciences could be turned into a Fraunhofer uh, institute according to our model with 30% uh, industrial revenue, 30% um, public grants and 30% institutional funding. So what we did we, was um, we set up Fraunhofer units, they were called as first for a test period of five years or so, and once they established themselves and they proved to work according to the Fraunhofer model, they were then turned into Fraunhofer institutes. There was a number of um, ten or so Fraunhofer institutes that were created that way. Okay, use the same financial well, ground rules. Well, well, I, yeah. want to, I want to keep going. Because we got I, I just wanted to add, quickly. in addition to Fraunhofer, Max Planck, um, Leibniz, Helmholtz, these other research organizations have also um, located centers in the eastern part of Germany. So the question right back in the back there. What is the... Oh, so we've been talking about uh, moving ideas and products quickly into the marketplace, and I wonder if you could comment, uh, especially Dr. Hilton, um, about the duration and the character of the graduate PhD experience and how that affects um, yeah, thank you very much for the question. That is actually a point that I um, sort of skipped in my presentation. Um, the close col collaboration with universities, of course, allows us, as I said, to uh, the institute directors to supervise a diploma and PhD thesis. And um, actually, f uh, students, uh, young students, love to work for Fraunhofer because we are seen as a as a springboard, as an excellent basis for a career. Um, in Fraunhofer, but also in industry, of course. And because we have such a broad range of industrial customers, um, they can learn, they can gain a lot of experience by working with Fraunhofer. They are in touch with customers, they get to know what their, what their needs are, and quite often they are employed, and they continue in their career by working for industry, and they become part of our valuable network. So quite often, uh, students do a PhD thesis um, at a Fraunhofer working at a Fraunhofer Institute, but of course officially only the university can give, <coughs> grant the title of a PhD or diploma. Right here. Hi, um, I'm glad we got to the issue of the labor force. It was mentioned early on in the um, presentation that Germany doesn't have a problem necessarily with the skilled workforce, and that's enabled some of this. I don't know what the extent of that is, but definitely in the United States we're struggling with um, a skilled, having enough skilled workers in, um, in technology and computer science and all of these fields that enable innovation, um, and particularly with the underrepresentation of women and minorities in these fields, that's one of the areas where we're struggling, and I was wondering if Germany has found any solutions to this problem, if you even have that problem, or if you could speak to that briefly. Woman has to answer <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I can only say that uh, we experience a similar problem. Uh, we, we, are, uh, we are aware that there, there is, especially in the technical fields, there is a shortage of skilled people um, and we are, we are reaching out to other countries. We are trying to encourage people from abroad to come to Germany to work in Fraunhofer institutes, but um, I don't have a, a good solution, a one-for-all solution. <laughs> 
So I want to um, let uh, Joanne have the last word and just make just a couple of quick closing comments. But before I do that, I wanted to say three quick things. One, uh, for those of you, I thought there were a lot of interesting data in the slides. Uh, the slide, the PowerPoints will be up on our website tomorrow if you want to look at them. And if you want to watch the event again tomorrow, just in case you missed something, there'll be a PowerPoint and the actual video will be up there as well. You can share it with your friends. Second thing is I have a, I have a hypothesis about German economic success and why they have technology policies, and that is that the ratio of economists to engineers in their government is quite low. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps that is something we might uh, learn from that. Uh, I'm, I really, I'm, believe it or not, I am quite serious. Uh, and, and the last point I have is, I, you know, I think we oftentimes make this quite complicated. Uh, you know, we look at nuance and, you know, how do we get this right? I think it's a really pretty simple message, what I heard today. And the message is simply uh, support uh, applied R&D cooperation between industry and research institutes. You know, that's really what we heard today. That's really at the core of what the Germans are doing. That's really not what we want to do because we have all of these weird ideological predispositions that says somehow that's bad. And I think until we get over that, uh, we're going to continue to... Uh, ten years from now, we'll have another presentation of why Germany is leading even more industries, and uh, hopefully they'll give us some to do something with. So, uh, anyway, so Joanne, you want to close this out here? So this afternoon, we've had the opportunity to compare approaches to innovation policy in the U.S. and Germany. And both countries are aware of the importance of science and technology and that they're instrumental in achieving sustainable economic growth and investment in these areas is a necessity. And as, as Minister Peter Fisher mentioned in his opening remarks, research intensive products and services make a significant contribution to the creation of value in Germany, more than in any other industrialized country. And we have also seen that one of the strengths of Germany's innovation model is the close collaboration between a number of players, including industry, universities, research research institutions such as Fraunhofer, as well as the government at the federal, state, as well as at the regional levels. And it is this collaboration which enhances and facilitates innovation. In addition, overarching strategies such as Germany's high-tech strategy, its excellence initiative, its pact for research and innovation, and um, the, all of these are significant contributions. And it's also within that the competition that exists, the excellence initiative ca has universities and industry competing against each other. And this also contributes to innovation. In addition, strategic global partnerships are key to successful innovation. Um, and Fraunhofer's um, partnerships in different parts of the world is just one example, as we've seen. Um, in his presentation, um, Greg Tassi discussed the importance of creating financial incentives. Steve, uh, Steve Meisel also mentioned that, that these incentives for private companies to increase investments in R&D and increase in the R&D intensity of the manufacturing sector. Um, he also stressed the importance of increasing federal investment in research aimed at objectives relative to private sector R&D targets. Um, now, Finally, I would just like to, I think we all agree that the German-U.S. dialogue and innovation policy needs to be continued. And as Engelbert Bayer mentioned in his talk, during the past 12 months, there have been two major conferences on innovation policy in Germany and the U.S. There was one on November 1st in, in Washington, D.C. Some of the people in this room I recognize were there. There was also one in Berlin um, on May 24th and May 25th in 2011. Um, another conference that wasn't mentioned was on June, June 9th here in D.C., organized by the American Institute of Contemporary German Studies, um, looking at universities as drivers of entrepreneurship and innovation. So I think we need to continue this dialogue. And also, I'd like to thank everybody for participating today, as well our speakers, our audience members, and those of you who are listening online. And um, let's continue. Thank you.